Testing one, two, three, you can hear me. Many thanks to our sponsors. And also I'd like to thank our uh, volunteers who are not sponsors, but uh, help us with their time and effort. Um, um, many of them, a uh, very impressive job they're doing, uh, including um, teaching me how to use this system here. <laughs> Let's see, let me get the right buttons for you. Okay. I'm Len Brown. I'm going to speak about a, uh, a program that I call Yogini that um, I wrote um, upon the advent of, oh, I work for Intel Corporation. And uh, Intel has come out with some new chips, uh, particularly for clients, which are a hybrid CPU architecture. And uh, that sparked my interest, um, or maybe my obligation, to, to pay attention to um, uh, more some more novel CPU uh, topologies and uh, how Linux handles them. Uh, my background is in uh, power and performance. And so uh, it's interesting uh, mix of uh, power performance and scheduling um, where, where we're now playing. And uh, so I thought maybe some tools would sort of pull some of these together and make this um, increasingly complex landscape a little more accessible so that, um, so that uh, both in the design, the debug, the understanding, the tuning, uh, all of this, you know, a, a, a tool to get, for more people to get their hands around this. Of course, the first person is for me, but, you know, uh, when other people create stuff with this, this tool, that will be um, validation that it actually uh, works. So I thought maybe uh, integrating the generation of workloads um, uh, hardware and software observation and report generation uh, would be a handy thing to do. So what we're going to do here is um, I'm going to go through an example. Um, then I'm going to talk about how the program works. Then I'll go through another example. Pretty simple agenda. So uh, to understand this example, first you need to understand the, the hardware that we're talking about. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is what Intel calls a two plus eight systems, so it has two P cores and it has two E cores, um, all in blue. Um, <clears throat> the P cores are, are multi-threaded, so from a uh, user's point of view, this is eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 CPU system. Um, and uh, let's see, as of Linux uh, 5.16, uh, ITMT, which is how Linux schedules on this kind of processor, um, will spread to the P cores before using the uh, HT siblings. So the HT siblings, those big half blue boxes are what's used last, and uh, the E cores are used uh, in preference to those. And then, of course, where those, these yellow boxes are supposed to be processes actually, you know, occupying those CPUs. Uh, this is called an Alder Lake uh, processor. So um, this is a picture of 12 threads, which we might throw at that 12 CPU system. And uh, the idea here is that, uh, you know, say one second apart after that first thread in, uh, on the bottom, the pumpkin colored one starts, say one second later, we start the red one, and a second after that, the yellow one, and a second after that, the green one, and so on. And uh, then we have the, and, and then what we would like to observe is, um, you know, where does the scheduler put these threads? Uh, we would expect, say, the pumpkin one here to be put onto a P core first, and then the red one to be put on the P core, and then um, the third thread we would expect to be put on an E core, and so forth. Uh, and the last two we would expect to consume the HT siblings, uh, sort of the CPUs of last resort. And then uh, when the first two threads exit, we would expect them to vacate the HT siblings first and you know, move things around such that uh, the hardware is used in that way. All right. so. This is one of the things that, that pops out of Yogini. Um, and it says, uh, it says, yes, we aced that test, basically. So the way you read this, um, time is across. This is a 22 second experiment. And this is, this is utilization, basically. And so you can see the first bump in blue is utilizing, uh, this is by kind of uh, CPU, blue is P core. And then the second bump is the second thread, the third bump, we start consuming the E cores, consume eight of those, and when those are all consumed, then we, um, we consume the siblings, and then we start removing threads because it was FIFO in this experiment, 
and we vacate them basically in this order. So um, very simple, right? Okay, if you're an executive, we're done. If you're an engineer, there's some understanding to be had. Um, okay, so if you actually, so Yagini, this is a, we're using a built-in workload here and the built-in workloads record how much work they're getting done, okay? So this is a little more subtle because instead of just saying, hey, the CPU is busy, great. Well, how much applications really care about work they're getting done? They don't care about if the CPU is used or not. And so there's a couple of things jump out when you draw the picture this way. One is there's that funny dip in the middle. Um, uh, and then there's sort of this kink on the left-hand shoulder or the, yeah, the, the shoulder further out by, uh, you know, 18 seconds. <clears throat> and so what's up with that? And, uh, and things aren't as smooth as they might be. Um, so if we draw this, since we've uh, recorded by, by task and by CPU, I should mention um, here, um, since we're enumerating the, the CPUs, if I, maybe I can, okay. Well, anyway, you can see uh, the, the blue is, is uh, P core zero, red is P core one, which is his HT sibling. So the way this is rendered, he's that red guy's popped in the middle. Remember, he was the last guy to get used, okay? So that makes, so he wasn't on top of the pyramid before, he's just rendered this way. And uh, similarly, uh, yellow and green, yellow is the, basically the second uh, P core and green is his HT sibling. So they're, they're used last, so it's, it's copacetic. You can glean a couple of things from this. One is, you can see how much work is now vertical, right? Not utilization. And so you can see how the P cores are getting more work done per time. These are, uh, these are like quarter second intervals, 250 milliseconds. Um, and uh, you can uh, notice some other subtle things. Anybody notice anything, anything else subtle from this graph? Ricardo does, but he's shy. So um, if you look at the, the, the blue, it sort of dips down as soon as the yellow starts, right? It wasn't it doesn't keep running as uh, getting as much work done as it used to, and you can also see uh, the left, um, you know, the uh, 18 second. You can really see the dip, and you can see what happened. It it seemed that every CPU dipped, not just one CPU went slow. They all started to go um, in concert, um, and then you can see at the end when the load starts to um, lighten. Uh, the sections get bigger, the CPUs start doing more work, okay? So uh, that's interesting as well. And so this is a graph that Yogini spits out of tracking frequency and uh, ignore the noise. Basically that's measuring frequency on effectively idle CPUs. So um, they're, they're not too interesting, but, the, but you can glean at the very beginning of the graph, you can see in this case, we're running at 4.2 gigahertz and then as soon as we start the, um, uh, uh, in this case, I'm sorry, the colors change. It goes um, uh, uh, blue, red, actually, actually the colors are the same. Um, we're measuring the frequency of red, even though nothing's running on it. Remember he's an HT sibling, so he's gonna run at the same frequency as his um, peer, even though there's nothing running on it. That's why blue and red are, are up there. Not that something's actually running. Something's only running on the blue one. Then when yellow joins them, you can see the frequency of blue and red. So single core turbo is, goes from 4.2 gigahertz down to four. And uh, we don't really notice that on P core, on the E cores, when they cut in, they cut in at three gigahertz immediately. And they don't go down until the, until the dip where everything dips at 18 seconds. So that explains um, part of the uh, strangeness we saw in the previous graph. Um, we can also look at the uncore. The uncore is basically, you know, effectively the bus on this processor, and uh, it follows a similar pattern. So that tells us that something that's managing the uncore and all of CPUs is managing the frequency on us uh, in concert. Um, okay, here's an eye chart for you. Uh, I'll give you a five. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'll be interested to know if anybody can glean anything interesting from this mess of mess of colors. Um, so. First thing you want to look at is the highest thing, right? So this is the IPC, it's instructions per cycle, per CPU. Um, and you can see, well, okay, so let's start with blue and red. Well, blue and red and uh, yellow and green, um, 
they all go along 2.2 uh, instructions per cycle. Those are your peak cores, the high line. The lower line is around 1.7. Those are all of your E cores. And the noise disappears as the E cores go from idle, where this is all sort of metastable, and there's very few instructions, so it's math on small numbers. But uh, when they're actually running, they all converge right, right in the center above seconds. And an interesting thing happens there. Um, you can see red goes from sort of metastable up to 1.5. Well, red was the HT sibling of blue, and blue comes down to meet it. So what happened was we started running something on an HT sibling, and uh, red started running up at 1.5 uh, instructions per cycle, but then we pulled blue down. So effectively, since we're running on HT siblings, it's not just how fast you're running, it's how much you slowed down the guy you're sharing the CPU with. Um, Importantly, uh, at this point, um, we're now running uh, a lower IPC than the E cores. And so this tells you from a scheduler point of view, E cores are better than P cores uh, when the HD siblings are busy. Okay, and that's an important observation. I should mention, um, uh, I'm not gonna get too much into the scheduler stuff. There is a scheduler microconference um, tomorrow afternoon and Ricardo and I will be talking about the scheduler aspect of this. This is, we're mostly just focusing on the tool uh, here. All right, um, this is IPC. Again, forgive the noise, but you can see it around 62.5. Um, every quarter second we have uh, um, 62.5 interrupts per CPU. What this basically tells you is that Tickless idle is working, okay? So remember the pyramid, we st right in the center, we're using all CPUs. We have very few interrupts on all of these uh, idle E cores, but in the middle when they're busy, everybody's ticking along at uh, 250 Hertz in this case. So 125 divided by two is what you see here because we're measuring on a quarter cycle interval. Good sanity check, and if something's wrong, you'd see it there. Uh, another thing you notice is that um, you you have more interrupts on P core one, uh, which which may which may be interesting. Um, okay, so uh, this is tracking temperature. So in trying to figure out why we have that uh, change in frequency, it might be interesting to know that there's a temperature limit, and the answer is no. We're under ADC, which is perfectly a okay. Though we do see things cool off quite a bit on that notch on the right-hand side, don't we? Uh, tracking volts. This is interesting because in this particular chip, what it basically says is all the voltages are the same, okay? They're tied together. Now, this is not the same on every chip, but on this particular one, uh, even the voltage of the idle CPUs is high. In this case, I don't know, 1.15. When they're idle and uh, their voltage is not lowering, so um, that's an interesting observation from an energy point of view. Uh, so talking about energy, everybody likes to think about power in terms of watts. This is a plot from the built-in uh, energy meter, which we convert to power. And this explains finally what's happening with the big notch on the right-hand side. Uh, so here we're plotting um, package is blue the entire uh, SOC, um, there's a subset of that which is IA, which is the, basically the cores, and depending on the chip, sometimes they're caches. And then uh, yellow is the difference between those two. Uh, that's not actually measured, it's just one of those minus the other one, which is interesting that it's a constant on this chip. Uh, graphics is reported as zero. I forget if this is, uh, I think it's actually non-zero, but it's so small you can't see it. In this experiment, I'm not using graphics. Um, and so uh, what you see is, uh, well, the, uh, uh, the y-axis is, um, is, is power, and this is a 15-watt TDP part. So at the uh, pinnacle of this experiment, we're running at around 50 watts. And it's hard to run at 50 watts in a 15-watt package for a long time. And so the hardware basically corrects itself after it, you know, it, it gives itself some rope and then it says, that's it. And it, uh, it had to lower the frequency to uh, maintain its average power budget. So it's runtime average power limiting is what caused that notch. 
Okay, now looking at this more from sort of a Linux and a work point of view, um, this is not a plot of processors. Um, the, uh, the key here, blue is actually, these are thread numbers. Remember we forked 12 threads and maybe in the beginning when I had that FIFO chart, um, these are the same threads. There's 12 of them, they're called get CPU because that's all this thread does is continuously ask where it's running. Uh, which makes it good at, very good at knowing where it is running. Um, and you can see that uh, thread, thread one uh, ran on CPU zero basically its entire life, okay? And uh, its HT sibling is CPU one, CPU two is the next P core, and its HT sibling is CPU three, and then you have the ADE cores. The ADE cores did oh, about the same amount of work. Um, and you can see, remember the top of that pyramid, we can see CPU three was what held something for, uh, th you know, three time quantums, and CPU one is the one that held something for for one time quantum, and uh, and you can actually see which thread uh, it was. In this case, uh, it wasn't CPU zero. It wasn't uh, get CPU um, uh, thread one. He had exited by. Uh, he was only. He was already. He was on CPU zero the whole time, but this last guy. Um, ran on CPU one, a little bit on CPU three, and then um, migrated. And so that begs the question of, okay, where did what run? This is actually, from a scheduler point of view, this is the interesting, this is where things get interesting. Most of that stuff was hardware stuff. So same key on the right-hand side, uh, blue is the first thread. And so he starts running on the far left side and he happened to run on CPU one. Uh, which for uh, sort of random where you wake up because he's a new task. And uh, that's the HT sibling for CPU zero, which is the bottom row, okay? Now, there's just a dot there and immediately the scheduler pulled him onto CPU zero. Why is that? Well, it's because as of this was, this was run in 5.19 and uh, it doesn't have Ricardo's latest patch to not do that. <laughs> so uh, where do we treat uh, CPU zero is a higher priority than CPU one, and we pull from zero from one to zero. Okay, and then he basically stayed there. Why does he leave right at around ten seconds? Well, this picture is reported just by Yogini, completely in user space. So it's self-reported. Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? You don't see if you run a kernel shark, you'll see uh, uh, K software QDs. Uh, you'll see um, any other activity in the system. Basically, he got kicked off of CPU zero, load balanced onto CPU one. CPU zero was a it was a short uh, uh, kernel thread. Then, then for the reason I just described, he got pulled back onto zero because we're pretending it's higher priority. Um, another interesting one might be uh, the red guy who started on CPU four, which is an E core. The P core very quickly pulled him down in the idle load balancer onto CPU two. You can see he got popped off the CPU a couple times. So one time he's way up on CPU 10, what's up with that? And uh, the answer is, well, he got pulled onto CPU three when a K thread ran on CPU two, but there was more than one thread. Um, and so uh, we now have multiple threads on an HT sibling. And in that case, the E core can run him faster. The E core idle load balancer says, hey, I can help with that. And he pulled that guy up to CPU 10 in the meantime, CPU two went idle again, and he says, hey, but I'm faster than you, as he pulled them all the way back to CPU two. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, you, you can draw this in a couple of different ways. You can have lines connecting it. This is actually just a scatter plot. Um, let's see if there's anything interesting. And then so more of the same. You can see how the, um, this, this shape is basically just from the, the loop inside the scheduler where we just pull onto the next CPU. There's nothing magic about that. And it, it's, and in a, um, and it, could, it could very well be a different uh, a shape. The important thing is um, really the number of migrations. I mean, for this test, there's 12 threads and 12 CPUs. The more you're migrating, that's tax, right? You don't wanna do these migrations. And uh, here there's about 50, it's about 50 migrations. And I think after a small patch that we have to this, we can even get rid of those. Makes this picture a little less interesting, but um, less overhead. All right, so let's talk um, a little bit about the tool itself. Julia. 
So is this small patch going to affect all the kernel or just the Alder Lake stuff? Um, oh, the patch that I refer to, Ricardo The, the ones said, that will reduce the migrations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that migration will help um, in ITMT. I think just when you're ITMT. ITMT is what, how the kernel runs on uh, a hybrid Intel uh, processor today. So yeah, and so in, so I'll need a slide that says instead of 516, it will be 6.1 or whatever that patch gets into and it will be a little cleaner. Honestly, on an interactive system, you probably won't notice, but on some, some things do, do notice 50 context switches. And, and in general, there's actually more complicated, um, since you asked, there's, there's other cases where, uh, uh, like this red guy and, and you moved here and then you moved, it's not just a simple case. It can actually prevent some more complicated things where you're, and you really have to scratch your head and figure out why the heck did he end up there and, and it eliminates those and sort of cleans things up. So I'm actually pretty optimistic about that, that change. Okay, so uh, mom and apple pie uh, generate well understood workloads. We'll talk about the workloads in a second. Um, the challenge is scheduler. Uh, power management and performance um, and be easy to observe. So we just went through some of the things we observed quite a lot with this tool. Um, and we can observe it sort of from a bottom line point of view, performance and power. And you could even divide them and, and, and turn that into efficiency and uh, battery life. Um, and uh, the, since the tests are simple, I'm hopeful that we can use this for regression tests um, to assure that we don't go backwards, which is something uh, as probably most people in this room are, are, um, are aware is a constant risk. And so uh, mom and apple pie make it easy to install, run, share, understand, compare, and extend. Extend is something um, I'm, I'm very interested in ideas on extending. Uh, I think it's very easy to install right now. It's a tar file and you run the program and save it to a TSV file. I, I import that into Google, what is it? Um, Google Drive, what's the spreadsheet thing? I forgot what Google calls it. Google Sheets, yeah, Google Sheets. And, um, um, you know, I guess, the, I guess this is a point of a success from a tool that you use it so much you no longer know what it's called. It's just there, right? So thank you, Google. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's laid out as TSV, you drag and drop and boom, the, the, the thing appears. In fact, so what I just went through, uh, it ran in a hundred, it ran in 22 seconds. I saved it, it probably took, you know, a minute to upload it into the thing. And then, uh, a couple of minutes to create the slides. It probably took me more time to change the font in this presentation to a subtle shade of green than it actually did to create, um, those graphs. Um, okay, so for each worker in Yogini, um, you can say what workload type you are. Get CPU is all I've told you about before. You can have any number of threads. Waveforms, which we'll talk about in a second. When to start and stop. You can affinitize threads and so forth. So um, to do this, first thing Yogini needs to do is to say, how fast is the hardware um, that I'm running on? Um, Let's see, I start at 12, I have till 12.40. Okay, we're coming up on halfway, right? Okay. Um, uh, we'll start a system monitor. The system monitor is what gave us all that stuff about what's your frequency and that kind of stuff. It's basically, in, it leverages a lot of the stuff I wrote for TurboStat. I don't know if you run a, if you, a tool I wrote that's in the kernel tree called TurboStat. It does quite a bit of the system monitor stuff already. Yogini sort of has the next generation of that. It's a little more clever because it's newer um, or I'm older. Um, then you run the work and uh, output the results. So calibration, um, the rate in Yogini is in terms of percentages. And so Yogini has to find out what is 100%. So it will go off and will run a loop and say, great, uh, that is 100% because uh, nothing else was running. And uh, I'm just going to declare what 100% is for this workload. Uh, you can skip that calibration by remembering the calibration from previously. Otherwise, it will calibrate um, at the, before we'll run a test. The rate, the simplest thing is to run at 100% for the, in this case, for uh, four times 10 seconds intervals. Um, uh, this, is a, and this is actually a real Yogini minus W rate 100. That's all you need to do. Um, 
There can be a start and a stop, okay? So this is what we did for that um, FIFO, right? That was a script that created those threads that started and stopped at different times, ran 100%. It's this. Uh, very interesting, often our periodic workloads, you can do that with a duty cycle. Here it's a duty cycle of 100%. And uh, you can run at a rate, this is actually sort of important, a rate of work. So you've anointed something to be 100%, so you can anoint something to be 42%. Um, and, well, what is 42 percent? Um, and, yeah, and, of course, you can duty cycle that, right, which, which isn't unrealistic, actually. There's some things that behave this way. Um, and so how do you create that 42 percent? Well, from a processor's point of view, you're either running or you're not running. And when you're running, you're running at a certain frequency. I mean, if you zoom in far enough. But if you take a step back and you combine... Running with sleeping, running with sleeping, that's what gives you your 42%. It turns it into utilization. So what Yogini does is it, sep it, it divides time, in this case, into intervals. The default is uh, 16 milliseconds. And so 0 to 1 is 16 milliseconds. And it might say, oh, I'm going to run 42%. How much work in 16 milliseconds should I get done in 16 milliseconds? It runs that amount of work, and it has no idea uh, if it's going to finish that work or not. Uh, now, in this case, since we've anointed it to be 42%, we know if we're running at the same speed as when we calibrate 100%, we're going to finish in 42% of the time. And then we, we see that we've got that work done. We sleep for the rest of the interval. Okay? And so you can set any, any percent. Also, uh, you know, say the processor were running slow because it were heavily loaded due to other processors or temperature or what have you, the tool doesn't care. It just says, at this amount of time, I want to get this amount of work done. And if I get it done, great. If I finish early, great. Um, if I don't, I get to the next interval and I just sort of start over again and say, well, what do I do in this interval? Okay, so the tool actually doesn't know about utilization. Utilization is a free variable. Work is a controlling variable. And that's an important concept. Okay, so how do you do something like this? Um, uh, we'll call this a ramp. Um, and the answer is uh, the, f the function says, well, in this interval, uh, my, fun my function is a ramp. And on the ramp, I should get 42% amount of work. And here, I should get 50% work. And it just asks for more work. And it does 100%. And the only thing that varies is how, soon, how, how early you finish, okay? So there's actually all kinds of crazy workloads. I, I even have a sine wave in there. I haven't, I don't know. You can, a ramp, ramp is the one that we use the most, but uh, we can add in all kinds of crazy functions for work, for work um, uh, shapes. And so I, I talked about work and utilization. They're two different things, um, and it's very important to distinguish them. System monitor, I showed you graphs for most of these already. There's a couple of more. Uh, I didn't show run queue because in that experiment, nothing was in the run queue, pretty boring graph. But from a scheduler point of view, run queue is pretty interesting. Um, oh, and the monitor, uh, it runs every quarter second, but you can set it to whatever you want. Um, uh, sometimes you want it fast, sometimes you want it slow for different reasons. Or you can turn it off completely. Um, the way the monitor works is uh, we, we fork, we create a monitor thread which, which, um, which then uh, forks off for, I don't know what, or will you IOU ring maybe someday. Um, thank you, Josh. Uh, uh, creates a bunch of other threads which um, uh, all park onto a CPU so that uh, it uses semaphore so that they can all take their statistics at the same time or very close to the same time. That's the what reason it's done. And this is a, an area where it's, it's actually smarter than TurboStat. Um, it's important to know when they're done, so the sem semaphore when they're done, so that you don't have a, a straggler um, and that your statistics are sort of lined up. It works, the graphs work much better when the times are all the same or close. Um, OK, so if you just type in Yogini, it will monitor the system for 10 seconds and spit out the results of the system monitor because you haven't given it a workload. One uh, thing that's useful is you can fork any program with Yogini, like, you know, time my program, Yogini my program. Uh, and it will do this measurement <clears throat> of this entire system while that program is running. Uh, that program, however, does not include the built-in 
where am I and how much work did I get done unless that program happens to do that for you. It's not a built-in workload, that's a forked program. Uh, this last example, like WAVX, so there's a built-in AVX workload, and that will do that. So it'll do an AVX loop, and like the get CPU loop, every now and then it breaks out and says, okay, it's been uh, this many loops. Uh, where am I and how much work have I got done? And so that we can track that over time at the end. And you can skip the monitor altogether. If you just wanted to run, uh, say, AVX, you could just turn the monitor off. Sometimes that's useful. Okay, library of built-in workloads. Get CPU, as I described. RDTSC, all it does says, what time is it, what time is it, what time is it? Pause and T-pause are also other ways to do as little as possible. Sometimes those are very interesting, particularly when mixed with other workloads, uh, particularly when you want the scheduler to say, be smart enough to put a pause loop uh, next to a compute um, loop on the same CPU so that one runs faster, for example. Uh, Reg AVX and Reg VNNI, AVX2, are, um, they're register only, so there's no working set. Um, uh, row 2 SSC is sim, streaming SIMD extension. I forget what SSC stands for. It's basically math with XMM registers. AVX is YMM. AVX512. Dot prod is, is basically a VNNI, so that's an AI um, dot product, but without the AI instructions. And then mem and mem copy, one's, uh, one's the Linux kernel mem copy loop and the other's libc. Um, so the, the reason they're in three groups is because uh, the first row has no working set size. The second row does. And this is important because the working set size can completely change what that system, what that loop, first of all, what its score is, right? It can run much faster in, in, in cache than it can if it explodes the cache. Uh, so it's important to know when you run it, when you're comparing which, you know, make sure you're comparing apples to apples. And, and B, you might want to say, I'm going to thrash the cache on this one or stay in the cache. Um, the default is just the L1D cache, which would be the speed of light. And then uh, the mem and mem copy, they default to the size of the L3. Oh, so this example in the bottom, um, here we have an AVX2 workload with a working set size of 256K and another thread which is a, a mem workload with a working set size of 100 megabytes. Okay. Oh yeah, question. Yeah. Go ahead and read it for me. Yeah. So, uh, okay. One, two, okay. So how the heterogeneous schedule behave seems Ecore couldn't run AVX slash AMX. Uh, I think the question was something about Ecore's running AVX. That's right. So seems the eCore couldn't run AVX slash AMX. How the heterogeneous schedule behave? Um, okay. So, um, so you. So first of all, I should mention on the first slide. I, I usually when I show the Intel hybrid architecture, I use the tagline: "All CPUs run the exact same ISA." So you have P cores and you have E cores. Um, all of them either run AVX or they do not. All of them either run VNNI or they do not. So Intel's products are homogeneous ISA uh, or all the same ISA. Um, so what Yogini does when it starts, it might be compiled, say, with AVX 512. And then if you run it on an Alder Lake, it's going to say, I don't have AVX 512. So when you try to run it, it'll just say, I, I can't run AVX 512. So um, I th hopefully that answers the question. There's a follow up. Um, the a person sent a link, so it's going to be hard for me to kind of click on that. But um, when Intel launched the 12th generation range back in November, uh, oh, okay, we were told Could you that do the mic. Maybe just take off your mask. I can't really understand you. No problem. All okay. right. So when Intel launched its 12th generation range back in November, um, we were told that AVX 512 wasn't enabled. Most of the tech press accepted that. Intel said it wasn't enabled due to the inclusion of two different architectures. The E cores didn't support it, even if the uh, the P cores did. Okay, so this is uh, tangential to what we're talking about today. So I, I won't go into it, but uh, it is true that um, that uh, there are SKUs of Alder Lake where if you turn off the E cores, you can run AVX 512, and Yogini would happily run AVX 512 on those. If you should have one, I don't have one. <laughs> okay. Okay, I better move along. Okay, uh, worker threads. We we already talked every 16 milliseconds. Um, oh yes, it's important to know that the worker threads are uh, 
they're self-reporting where they are running and they're self-reporting how much work they got done. The first one they're an expert in since they're doing the work. The second one, you know, it is possible to switch somebody there and back and uh, him to say, I, I never knew that I was running somewhere else. Very difficult to fool the get CPU loop since all it does is say, where am I? Um, okay, so we'll quickly go through the second uh, example. Okay, this is a different um, this is a different CPU. This one has one P core with no HT and four E cores. Um, and uh, in this particular one, um, we're running uh, EA, an EAS prototype that Ricardo built, I think, two, a, a long time ago. And the E cores are more efficient than the P cores. So what we want to do is a ramp down. Okay. So we're going to do a single thread. He's going to start at 100% and then ramp down to, uh, say, 1%. And we would expect that at 100%, he won't fit on, this, on, the, on the E core. He'll run on the P core because that's where he can fit. Right? That's how EAS works. And, um, and then uh, when he's small enough, we should see him migrate to the efficient CPU when his demand is small enough. And that's what, indeed what we see. So what we see, this is a plot, uh, not of utilization, but actually I went straight to work for time. You can see the left, he started out actually on CPU one, which in this case was a, uh, a, an efficient, an E-core, and uh, he couldn't quite finish the work that he wanted to get done. Uh, interestingly, it took 250 milliseconds for him to migrate to a P-core and then he made up for it. He sort of spiked above what he above the program, and then from there on out, he was on a smooth 100% of what he's asked for. Now down in the middle, we sort of went metastable, right? Uh, we were doing some work on CPU zero, and we were doing some work on CPU four. In this case, CPU four is the P core. Sorry, the numbering is is backwards on this, this CPU. Um, uh, yeah. So the answer is it basically worked, but it not really that great, honestly. Um, and so if you look a little more closer, in this case, we'll show the percent busy utilization curve after. Um, boy, that looks very strange on the middle and the right. And you can see that, um, um, uh, yeah, we're, we're keeping, uh, let's see. <laughs> um, we're keeping two CPUs busy for when we're jumping back and forth. And the other thing is we don't really see the, um, the E-core ramp down. Okay, in busyness. Okay, now why would that be? One minute. Okay, no, and the no, there's another question online. I'm sorry. Okay, let me finish explaining this sorry. picture. Yeah. Okay, and the answer is because the frequency ramps down. Okay, so if you're doing less and less work and your frequency goes down and down, your utilization stays the same, right? Okay, um, and you can also see here the similar thing with the orange didn't get smaller here either, and that's because the we were at max frequency and our utilization went down, but then the utilization stays the same and the frequency goes down, okay? So what does this mean for power? And in this case, we see a significant drop in power when we actually started spending most of our time on a more efficient CPU, which is the goal. Uh, and I think I just said that. Okay, so what, what's, so uh, in addition to the workloads that I've, uh, uh, built into the tool already. I'd be interested to know if there's other interesting ones. Um, regression test scenarios um, where we can see that, you know, say, for example, in that ramp down thing, we can measure the total power, we can measure the efficiency, and we can run that before and after kernel change to see if we made things more efficient or less efficient. Um, I'm not really a whiz at, at tools, but I just output this TSV and import it into Google Sheets. And uh, um, that works for me, but maybe there's a more clever way to do it. Ricardo became impatient with that and has his own scripts in, in R or something that I don't understand, but they're pretty cool. They, they're, they're pretty. And, um, and what's the best way to distribute? I do TurboStat on the kernel tree. I don't I know if that's the best model, but maybe there's that or better. I'm open to uh, um, input. All right, why don't we start with a question online? Yeah. Um. Okay, so is Yogini more of a workload generator or workload monitor? That's question number one. And then uh, question number two, um, okay, annoying question. For synthetic workload generation scheduler people uh, themselves use RT um, app. What was, uh, was RT app looked at? Okay, the first 
question was something about being a workload generator and a monitor. And one, uh, one or the other. Where, am I one or am I the yeah. other? Are, are you generator or monitor? Yeah, so that's the whole idea is to integrate those together. Yeah, so Yogini, you, you type it in, it, it just, it's really quite easy. So I have a bunch of scripts around it. And um, yeah, it's a workload generator and monitor built together. That's the idea was to, was to integrate those to make it simple. I'm sorry, I've lost track of what the second question was. Um, RT app, something about RT That's right. So um, synthetic for synthetic workload generation, scheduled people sometimes use RT app. Was RT yeah. app looked at? Yeah, um, I'm not an expert RT app. We've used RT app, um, but um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I really don't have much to say about RT app. Uh, I, so, so I mean, we're not replacing kernel shark. We're not replacing tracing. Uh, we're not replacing perf. We use some of those features uh, here. The idea here is to integrate them to make them easy to use. All right. There's another question. Uh, would Yogini welcome other architectures such as ARM or Risk V? I knew I'd get that question. <laughs> um, so, in fact, I have to admit I haven't even run it on an AMD system at this point. Um, so I haven't. Uh, you know, I work for Intel and and all the computers in my lab are Intel. So that's what it runs on. But uh, I have no doubt that is the day I release it, somebody will say, here's the patch to make it work on AMD. And then, yeah, there's no reason that it couldn't run on, on ARM. The, the, the built-in workloads are actually, most of them are in C. And the directives are things like, you know, hey, use AVX 512. Well, that's not going to work very well on ARM. So it would probably say, hey, use whatever ARM uses. So that same C code could probably um, compile there. Any other questions? Did I come in under budget? Yeah, yeah, you are. Awesome. Okay, thanks very much. All right.